probably got my best lesson about what what might be going on between mothers and babies when I gave birth to our second child two years later. And I thought, this, this cannot be easy for the mother and the baby to be separated, for either one of them. And I began to think about that and got interested in it and, you know, saw little signs along the way that this might be true, but it was kind of in the back of my mind. Then when I decided that I wanted to go back to school and I, I thought, well, you know, I did teaching, I really love teaching, but I want to do something else now. And what I decided I wanted to do was to go into psychotherapy, some kind of psychology. And in doing that, I had to write a thesis, so I decided to write my thesis on um, adoption. And of course, I had to find people to talk to because I wanted to find out what, what adopted people felt about adoption. So I put aside a, a little piece of the paper asking for people to come and talk to me about it, fill out a questionnaire and so forth for my thesis. And it's interesting because the people who came to talk to me said they couldn't figure out why they answered that ad because they'd never talked about adoption. And it was something that they just didn't feel they had the right to talk about, especially uh, in a way that was more from the heart, you know. So that's, that was the basis for my, um, my thesis, was talking to those people, getting, getting some kind of information from them about how, how they felt about adoption. And I continued to do research, I continued to talk to people. I have a bad knee, so at some point I need to want, kind of rely on this stool. So um, anyway, um, then I went to a, a, I, I decided to send a proposal into the adoption, so the American Adoption Congress, to give a talk on on my thesis after I had graduated and so forth. And I had a little blurb in their their newsletter about what I was going to talk about. It was called the Primal Wound Legacy of the Adopted Child. And when I went into the room that I was supposed to speak in, it was a room about this size, but I'm telling you, it was absolutely packed with people, adoptees and birth moms, because they had never heard anybody speak of adoption the way I was speaking of adoption in, in that blurb that I had. It was actually a whole page about what I was going to speak on. And then after I got to talking, um, well, I read my speech for one thing because I wasn't used to giving speeches. And I got a, a five minute standing ovation after I finished speaking. And they said, you have to write a book. We have to highlight what you're saying. And that was the impetus. You know, once you finish your thesis, you're kind of done with it, <laughs> tired of the whole thing. And, but my thesis was still in 1986 and this was 1991. So, so I decided, okay, I'll, I'll write my book now. And so my thesis was the basis for my first book, The Primal Wound. <coughs> and since then, I have just felt more and more validated for what I've said in that book because I have hundreds, probably thousands of letters from adoptees. And one of the things they say is that you know me better than anybody. Well, I don't. I don't know them better than anybody. What I know is how they've been coping with the loss of their first mothers. And that's what I write about in The Primal Wound. It isn't about anybody's personality or anybody's character traits. It's about how people cope with that loss. And so that's a much more predictable thing to write about than everybody's personalities and all that kind of thing. In fact, people's personalities get very much lost a lot of times in adoption. And <coughs> there's good reason for that. And, and this makes it really hard for us adoptive parents to know who our kids are sometimes, you know, because we're, we're dealing with their coping mechanisms. We're dealing with the fact that, that they don't trust very much, that they feel that they don't want to get too close because people leave. And even though <clears throat> the loss is something they don't remember specifically because they don't have long-term memory, but, you know, at birth, they don't get long-term memory until they're two or three years old. And so some of the adoptions today, the children will have more of an understanding of what happened to them because 
they um, they were with their they've been with their biological families longer, and they may have some kind of memory about about that family and about what happened after that. But basically, a lot of a lot of the people that I deal with in my practice were were adopted at a time when when that wasn't the case. The, the, what what um, Adam was talking about. Most of them were the white women giving birth with, out of wedlock and going to white families. But it doesn't really, I mean, in any case, separating the mother from the baby or the mother from the child is a trauma. It's a trauma for the child. And one time I, I had to um, testify in a case where a mother wanted her child back and they were, you know, saying, well, this happened and that happened and so forth. But she had really been straightening out her life, was getting things in a, in a way in which she could have her child back. One of the things she had to do was make sure that she didn't have abusive men in her life for the, for the child to be exposed to. And <clears throat> she was doing better with that. But anyway, one of the people said, well, you know, but, but she has been she has been abusive to the child and, she, and so forth and I said yes and you have to be very careful when you give a child back to the original mother that this is going to be a good placement for the child I said but you have to know too that in foster care these kids are crying and they're crying out for those mothers even those abusive mothers and even if you can't give them back to those abusive mothers you have to empathize with the fact that they want them and this is what I say to adoptive mothers too, because even though we are the mothers that are giving them what they need, they also have that other mother within them somewhere, and that other mother has them within them as well. And so we can't, we can't just say, well, now I'm your mother, and forget everybody else. They may not have any conscious memory of her, but they have a memory. There's explicit memory and explicit memory, and implicit memory are the things that happen in the first two or three years of life where we don't have the long-term memory, but we do have a kind of memory, and that memory is very powerful in the way we see the world, the way we view ourselves, and the way we value those people, the other people in our lives, and how we can trust them, and so forth. So um, even, even though, and, and you know, when they talk about parents that don't tell their kids they're adopted, you know, they know something. They know something's different. Because here's, here's what I learned when I travel around the world talking about adoption. Many adoptees feel really comfortable in their adopted families in the sense that they feel loved and cared for. <coughs> but I've met very few of them who feel as if they really fit, really fit in that family. And this is something that I think we, we have to look at a little differently because I certainly didn't think about that too much, although, you know, my daughter is very different from me, very different from the rest of the family, but it didn't dawn on me why she was so different, and um, because of, of who she is, of who, of, of, of the person that she is, of, the, of the, her, her background in, in her DNA, that she's much more, um, much more extroverted than anybody else in the family, and that's great because it makes the rest of us blossom a little bit more, you know? <laughs> I mean, this is the thing that we have to know. We adoptive parents can learn just as much from our kids as they do from us. Because they can make us, they can, they can make parts of our personalities that may not have been fostered in our, in our own families. Can, can kind of bring some of that out. So, um, but that's, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. I do, I do want to talk about separation trauma because this is something that I feel is so important for everybody to understand. You know, so many adoptees have not understood why they felt the way they did, what their attitudes were. You know, they come to me at 40 and say, I don't understand why I treated my adoptive parents the way I did. They were doing the best they could and I don't understand what was going on. Well, separation trauma, you know, one thing I knew as I say, after I gave birth, is babies know their own mothers. They know that mother through all their senses. And we adoptive parents don't pass that sensory test. You know, we don't smell right, we don't sound right, we don't have the, um, one boy and one boy, he was 25 or something, but anyway, a boy in um, New Zealand, I think it was, told me that when he, he met his birth mother, he had to touch her skin because it was the right skin. And whoever thinks of that, 
you know, I certainly hadn't thought of that. But then I started thinking about it. And there are things about, about ourselves that we recognize in those of us, in those people who are related to us. And, you know, one way I try to explain it to people, because they say, well, you know, but they were just a tiny little baby. So, you know, I mean, yeah, but they had all that DNA to start with. And I said, you know, picture yourself being, being a member of the family like three doors down from you. Now, you may really have liked that family. Maybe some days when you were mad at your parents, you wished they, that they were your parents, you know. But really think about it. Think about how it would be to be a member of that family instead of a member of the family that you grew up in, where you had those genetic cues, where you knew things about them because they were related to you. Because that's, that's more of a big deal than I ever thought it was. And I, I learned that from adoptees after you know, talking to them many, many years. They call it genetic confusion. That there's gen such a thing as genetic confusion. And um, it, it takes many forms. Okay, well, what happens, <clears throat> you know, in those first years of life? We're talking about, we're talking about kids that are separated pretty early on. There are lots of neurological things that happen in those first years, like 100 billion neurons that are being connected. Mm -hmm. And according to the neurologists, these neurons are being connected as a result of one's experience in life. And so whatever this experience is you're having at the beginning of your life is, is creating these connections in your brain. And those connections in your brain are going to form your belief system about yourself and about others, about your place in the world. And so we have to really remember that all of those things that happen in a baby's life in the beginning, which they have no <coughs> conscious memory of, is going to have a big influence on them and, in, and on us as well. So it's very important to remember that because often, as I say, if they're not adopted from foster care, but even when they're adopted from foster care, oftentimes they aren't. They don't remember when they were placed in foster care because that was a young age. And so there are all kinds of things. And, and then trauma itself creates its own uh, amnesia. A lot of times people who have trauma do not remember things surrounding the trauma, sometimes even a day before, or the day after, or several days after. So. It is my belief, and I had it validated thousands of times from all these emails I get from adoptees, that, that this is a trauma, this separation is a trauma, and it, it creates an issue for them, several issues for them. <coughs> now, one of the things that we know as mothers about our relationship with our children is something called attunement. Attunement is when, you know, the mother is, is tuning into her child's emotional state so she can help, she can help create a safe place, uh, uh, confine that, that uh, emotional state so it doesn't get out of control. But if, if adopted mothers don't understand that the child is suffering the, the loss of that first mother, it's very difficult to be able to know how to help the child within that emotional state or even how to recognize it, because babies don't, they don't put forth the same kinds of uh, uh, emotional states that adults do. So it's sometimes hard to know exactly what's going on with them. But if we can know right from the very beginning that these children have, a, have suffered a loss, all of them, whether they came to us at three years old, at three days old, 14 years old, they all suffered loss. And some of them, those who have come out of the foster care system, have suffered many, many losses. I mean, I don't know how they can trust anybody. And they don't. They don't trust people. Because people keep leaving them all the time. One of the things I tell foster parents is, is if you're going to be the adopted parents, you need to stop having foster kids because these foster kids are in and out, in and out, in and out, and your adopted kids are not going to believe you when you tell them that they're permanent. They're just not going to believe it. And, you know, maybe they'll believe it when they graduate from high school or something, but really, they, they see these kids coming and going, and they, they don't know when it's going to be their turn. 
And the reason I know that is because even kids that aren't in foster care, in foster families, have that same fear. After all, one mother gave them up, so why wouldn't you? And even if they can't remember consciously that, that separation, they know it. You know, there are a lot of things we know, but we can't figure out why we know them. We have to trust them a little bit more. That's one of the things I really believe.